Hey you dirty birds, sit back, grab a beer and some pickled eggs because we have the latest episode of Castle Rock and Think Story is here with a detailed breakdown of the episode and what we could be in store for this upcoming season. You're going to want to stick around because we'll be discussing the Alan Pangborn letters, the mystery CD, and Ace's connection to the settlers. So let's get started. We begin in 1993 Somalia on the eve of what is known as the Battle for Mogadishu. If you've ever seen the Ridley Scott film Black Hawk Down, you can get a better sense of what happened from the American perspective. In fact, later on in the episode, we'll actually see a helicopter crash into the streets of Mogadishu. Young Nadia and Abdi are enjoying their lives, but for Nadia's mother, she wants her kids to go to America where it's safer, especially Abdi who's beginning to fall into the wrong crowd. When she finds Abdi has been given a gun, she goes to take it back only to be shot by an American soldier in front of her kids. We'll get more into that in a bit. We then flash forward to present-day Castle Rock where Nadia watches Pop who is recovering from the mini-stroke he experienced last episode. It's no wonder we focus on these two as their relationship is at the core of this episode. Ace drives past Joy, who we saw last episode cut by her mother. She's still sopping wet from the rain and is approached by Ace, who offers to take her home. Not where she wants to go right now. And kids, remember, never get in a stranger's car. Jamal asks Nadia if she's ready to help out at the church where she offers her services as a doctor to the homeless. This is the Church of the Incarnation, which played quite prominently in Season 1. We even have our first crossover character, Pastor Drew. In Season 1, he led his parishioners to teach Bible study to the prisoners at Shawshank, which Henry Deaver used to gain access to the kid. Chance breaks into Annie's home at the behest of Joy to grab her things. A particular note is the lockbox which Joy has specifically requested. We'll find out later what's inside it, but from episode 1 we know it at least contains a gun and license plates. Back at the Church of Incarnation, Nadia talks to Joy about her predicament. She can either call the police or go back to her mother, but Nadia sees something in Joy and decides to take her in. We've seen Nadia break the rules if it means showing compassion, like how instead of turning Annie in for stealing meds, she wrote her a prescription. Back at the Starlight, Chance is caught grabbing Joy's things and is confronted by Annie, but Annie is quickly put in her place when Chance reminds her that she almost killed her own daughter last night. Something Annie struggles with this episode, taking to junk food and watching old movies like The Wizard of Oz. Annie storms up to Nadia at this Somali mall, demanding she be taken to Joy. This scene clearly displays how hypocritical Annie is, lying profusely to Nadia while she's told Joy on multiple occasions how bad it is to lie. Needless to say, Annie's actions have landed her out of a job, so it'll be up in the air whether she will still have access to these meds. Annie immediately heads over to Nadia's home looking for Joy when Abdi pulls a gun on her. Joy told him what Annie did to her, and Abdi's the type of guy who won't take shit from anyone. Look at me. Sure. I'm the captain now. A few beetles surround Ace's truck, we've seen them the last few episodes, as well as in the crypt beneath the new Somalian mall. Whatever is down there has taken a hold of Ace, and we'll learn a bit more of what could be taking hold of him a bit later on. Ace is creepily watching old home videos, which he tells his brother Chris is to reflect on, but to me it's almost as if he's learning, using the videos to learn about his past since I'm not sure whatever has control of his body knows everything about him. Two other weird things we'll learn about him this episode is his ability to speak French and ordering of red wine at the bar. Two things I wouldn't really expect someone who has come off as somewhat of a redneck would know or do. But let's also remember the name of one of the plaques in the crypt. It's French, Damien Auquin. So my theory so far is that Ace is possessed by this original settler. More to come on that in a bit. At the hospital, Nadia reviews Pop's latest blood work and the news isn't good. His last round of chemo didn't work, but there are alternatives. A friend of hers at the VA could get Pop at the top of the list for new experimental therapies. That is if Pop is willing to undergo them. The chemo has already put him through a lot, and he'll need some convincing to accept anything new. But Nadia will stop at nothing to heal Pop. For her, it's more than just saving his life. It's about redemption. She could never save her mother back in 1993, but with Pop she has a second chance. By fixing him, she'll feel redeemed that she was at least able to save someone she loved. 
The irony of this situation is that it was him who killed her mother. Ace's dog goes nuts as he takes out two duffel bags from his home. We haven't seen what's in these bags, but my best guess is that it somehow involves whatever he's planning with his other converts. He drives over to the Marston residence where Hassan and Valerie, the real estate agent, are waiting for him. They were both previously brought under the control of whatever is taking over this town. Nadia tries to get Chris to work on Pop accepting this new treatment. Because if Pop doesn't accept, his death, in her mind, will be her fault, just like her mom's. Pop visits Pastor Drew and asks for guidance about the thing that's eating away at him. Not the cancer, the guilt of not being honest with Nadia about her mother. Pastor Drew has an odd question for Pop. If he does confess, what does this confession cost her? It's this talk with Pastor Drew that later causes Pop to burn a letter he had saved for Abda and Nadia upon his death. It was a bit tricky to read, but here's an excerpt from the bottom portion of that letter. Quote, I came across your mother in a hostile situation, and things went terribly wrong as they sometimes do in combat. Your mother was a casualty of that. The burning of the letter signifies his refusal to open up the past, believing it better to let the secret die with him, a choice that will later come back to haunt him. Outside the church, the scripture reads, Ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, which could align with Pop's story arc. The thing he hasn't asked for yet is forgiveness. We also get this shot of Hassan waiting outside the church, and as we later find out at the end, Pastor Drew has been converted, and it's likely around here that this change took place. Inside the Emporium Galorium, Pop stands in front of a wall of clocks, a subtle reminder that time for him is running out. In fact, the very first shot that takes place in Castle Rock this season is of a group of clocks at the Emporium. Pop has decided to hold an Irish wake for himself while he's still living. And can I just say, I love how the coffin is filled with beers. Family and friends, if you're watching, that's what I want. Chance arrives at Abdi and Nadia's place, giving Joy the lockbox and some extra minutes on her phone so they can keep in touch. I also think it's a bit odd we haven't seen Chance's parents yet, but I'm probably overthinking it. Joy is able to figure out the code 1225, which is Christmas Day. Inside, we see the gun and the plates, but are given something new, a CD-ROM with the date September 7th, 2004. Now, this date could have two meanings. It's either Joy's birthday, which matches with her age in the show, or the revision date of The Ravening Angel, the novel found on the CD. The Ravening Angel is this same name that was found on the box a young Annie Wilkes took Joy out of in Episode 1. This book has no author on it, so we can't be sure if this is Annie's novel or someone else's. But if it is someone else's, my bet is on Joy's father. And while Joy buries the gun, Annie eats away her feelings while watching The Wizard of Oz. Nadia finds out that Pop is eligible for a new clinical trial, but in order to get it, she needs his army discharge form. Knowing that he likely wouldn't give this up willingly, Nadia sneaks into the Emporium to find it. While searching his desk, she finds a stash of open letters between former Shawshank prison warden Dale Lacey and Alan Pangborn. In season one, these two characters conspired with one another to keep the kid locked up in Shawshank. Which begs the question, does Pop know about the kid who is still in prison there by Henry Deaver? And I think it's totally possible, especially considering this image here, which shows that Dale Lacey was communicating with Reginald Pop Merrill. There's also what appears to be a charcoal sketch of eyes, and we know from season one that Dale Lacey was fanatical about drawing pictures of the kid. I really hope there's a great connection between Pop and these letters, and the overall evil that is taking over the town, and these just weren't put in there for shits and giggles. Nadia is able to find the files, but is attacked by Lance and one of his goons who have a message for Abdi. But Nadia is able to fight them off. At Pop's wake, Tim is caught stealing beers, but Pop is cool and lets him go with a bunch, even filling his backpack up with more. Ace tells Pop that he's done causing shit with Abdi, while both the cop and real estate agent stop by with more nefarious intentions. Nadia overlooks Pop's papers and finds out he was deployed to Mogadishu, the same time her mother was shot. He was involved in Operation Gothic Serpent, a real-life mission conducted by the U.S. Special Operations Forces to capture the Somalian National Alliance's leader, Mohamed Farah Aidid. At the same time, Pop gives his own eulogy, which isn't the most heartwarming, as he tells the guests that fostering Abdi and Nadia was, quote, Just another goddamn debt to be settled. 
Remember last episode he offered to adopt Abdi and Nadia to make things easier for the business. A thought which caused resentment for Abdi because imagine being told the main purpose for this adoption was business. If Pop is to change as a character, he'll need to see Nadia and Abdi not as a debt, but as his real children. Hassan, the real estate agent, and the cop take out Timothy, the bartender, and councilwoman Pinto, respectively, likely adding them to their possessed cult run by Ace. We even get this shot of Valerie eating an egg just like Hassan did last episode. Nadia asks Chris if he knew about the truth about Pop, but as far as I know, only Ace and Abdi knew of the secret. Ace brings Chris to the church where we get a little more insight into what is happening. He tells him that Jerusalem's lot was first settled by a special group of people and says, quote, this land, you might say, is still theirs. We know that hundreds of years ago, a group of witches, or as Pop calls them, Satanists, once lived on the land, but they were later burned. We've already seen two burned bodies in the Marston residence. Ace tells Chris that these souls defend the land they were promised and that he's creating a type of fellowship. My best guess is that when Ace was killed among the corpses of the settlers, his soul was inhabited by one of these satanic entities, now hell-bent on taking over the town as was promised. Chris is stabbed by his own brother, but he's able to fend him off and get help from the pastor, or so we think. The pastor, too, has fallen under this spell, telling Chris before he brutally stabs him that they'll, quote, make you good as new, son. It looks like whatever goo bath the cop was put into also has some healing properties. And if the goo can heal, could this be a way Pop can cure his cancer? And in our final heart-wrenching scene, Pop tells Nadia he's done with chemo. He's given up. Nadia confronts him about her mother, and he's at a loss for words. The secret he tried so hard to keep is finally out. Everything doesn't seem to be going well for our characters, except, of course, our main antagonist, Ace. I expect next episode we'll pick up with Annie's storyline and uncover even more Castle Rock mysteries. Thank you for watching. Please smash that cock duty like button and subscribe. I've got more Castle Rock videos coming your way, and let me know what you thought about the episode or your theories below. You can also reach me on Twitter at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember, Daddy loves you very much.